take a moment to settle in for study and trust the brightness of our minds to be able to contemplate and reflect upon the sutras that we've studied over the past week. And I began by chanting the mantra for study. If you know it, chant along. If you don't, I just invite you to listen and know that this mantra, this chant, is a prayer for study together and that the study illumine our consciousness, that it honor and protect the teachers, and that there be spiritual friendship between us and no discord. Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karvavai Tejas Vinavadi Tamastu Mavid Vishavahai Oh Shanti 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 May our study today honor our teachers and bring illumination. We are in week nine, moving into week 10. And if you saw the email I sent yesterday, I revised the reading schedule so that it shows the weeks, the week numbers, and then some small tweaks that I noticed would be more beneficial for our study in the numbering. Moving right along, we are at Sutra 37 in the first chapter in Roy Jean Davis's The Science of Self-Realization. That chapter is called Samadhi. And we are beginning with Sutra 37. Mental stability can also be experienced by contemplating the states of consciousness and virtuous attitudes and behaviors of spiritually enlightened saints and sages. We continue on to discuss the ways that mental stability can be achieved. In Sri Davis's commentary, he invites us to um, consider these questions, you know, what it would it be like to be self-realized? What will I think and feel? What will I do? How will I be when I'm spiritually enlightened? I hope that you took some time to work with those questions and ask yourself these questions. If not, do so now. You know, what will I be like when I'm enlightened? How will I behave? What will be at the center of my life? What will no longer be a part of my life? I'm sure that each of us has an inspiring teacher or saint or sage or person that when we think of them and how they lived their life or how they've responded to situations in the world or in their own lives or even between you and have inspired you, 
contemplating, you know, what might they do in the circumstance that I'm in or what advice do I think they would give? It's always useful. You know, we can't really um, step into another person's consciousness, but we can imagine and reflect upon and remember ways that we've been influenced by their teachings, their being, their example, and let that inspire us. In the sutras, it is advised for stabilizing the mind during meditation. So I um, remind you of how we often begin meditation with chanting the Guru Mantra and bringing to mind the saints and sages in our own lineage. And we do this to honor them, yes, to remember why we study, to remember the spiritual family to which we belong, but also to begin to commune in consciousness with these great yogis. So whatever you understand about communing in consciousness, hold that in your mind now and maybe think back to a time when you knew you were communing in consciousness or um, felt the benefits. Even um, think to a time when maybe you were meditating with Yogacharya and how it felt to be sitting in meditation in, in the same space. And uh, that might help you to think about what it is like to commune in consciousness, to be lifted up in consciousness through the thought or nearness of someone who is awake. Sutra 38. Also, by acquiring knowledge of sleep and dream states, so mental stability or focus, attention, can also be acquired by the knowledge of sleep and dream states. In Roy G. Davis's commentary, he says, as skill in experiencing superconscious states is acquired and intellectual and intuitive powers are improved, the full range of consciousness will be comprehended. Always <clears throat> in his commentary, he declares, <laughs> things will happen, you will know. It's not maybe, it's not, well, I kind of think. He's very sure. This is faith in the teachings and in his own experience. The full range of consciousness will be comprehended. Sutra 39. The mind is stabilized and awareness is clarified by steady meditation on one chosen object of attention. The contents of the mind become orderly and awareness becomes clear when attention is completely involved with one object of interest. So we might think that this sutra is a, is a restating of focus your mind on a single point and mental stability will follow. But the important words 
used in this sutra and in the commentary here from Roy Jean Davis is chosen object, object of interest, curiosity and inspiration. So there are many ways to focus the mind and many tools and techniques to use. And if we are not um, drawn in by our curiosity, our interest or inspiration, our practice becomes dry and I would say difficult at times because we're not inspired to practice. You know, when you're feeling um, dull, maybe your mind is feeling dull, you maybe didn't get enough deep, good rest, or, you know, you've been engaged in an activity that was not stimulating, and then you try to go and meditate, it, it's difficult to, um, difficult to do, to keep your attention, difficult to lift yourself into um, <laughs> easy practice. But if there is a practice that truly um, inspires you or, you know, gets you going in meditation, let's say, uh, maybe think about what it is for you. I particularly um, love to contemplate OM and listen to inner sound. It really focuses me and... When I'm contemplating OM, often it expands my consciousness in ways that other practices don't. So I, I get to my practice and I'm looking forward to becoming still enough to listen for inner sound. And that is inspiring for me. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm ready to go. I'm on the mat, I'm ready to go. If I didn't have options <laughs> for practice, or um, didn't feel free to engage in what inspires me, uh, I don't know how far along I would be. I don't know how much progress I would make. If it wasn't for kirtan and, <laughs> you know, um, uh, mantra, all these different ways to practice. you know, your own temperament wouldn't be accommodated, right? I mean, we're each very different and different things um, work or don't work for each one of us. That which inspires you is how you should practice. And additionally, I must say that um, our practice should follow as we are instructed from our teacher and luckily our teachers give us several ways and many techniques but should also not be complicated or distracting so you know if you're thinking well that means i can add music to my practice not to your silent sit right i mean maybe prior but during, we are trying to allow the mind to um, rest in stillness. And we don't want to add something in like music to accompany our meditation. You understand what I'm saying? I thought it should be simple and not distracting. Sutra 40. Proficient practice of samadhi enables one to acquire mastery of attention and to perceive that which is small and that which is of ultimate magnitude. Thank goodness for Roy Eugene Davis for clarifying this one for us. When powers of concentration are developed, accurate knowledge of what is observed can be perceived. When our mental field is clear and pristine, 
we see what is there. We see reality. We see clearly. Accurate perception. And this isn't, you know, simply seeing with the eyes. This is seeing with our being, recognizing, um, perceiving clearly that which is rather than clouded by um, wanting to see that that we want to see <laughs> or uh, confused about what is appearing before us. Not, and again, I say not just with our eyes, but you know, what is really happening, what reality, true reality is. And here it says, that which is small and that which is of ultimate magnitude. When we are truly proficient and truly um, established in the fullness of our knowing, nothing will be unattainable. When awareness is blurred, reflections are distorted. 